Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Minister. Lovely to see you again at Women's Forum. We are setting the scene to talk about global instability. So I want to take you right to the events, one of the most dramatic events that really symbolizes instability. And this was a vote on the 23rd of June, 2016, the vote for the UK to leave the European Union. Now this is a crack in a post-World War II plan to avoid the likelihood of another war by fostering close economic ties. From what you've seen in the latest Brexit plan, if it proceeds, do you think it can restore some stability here in Europe? I hope so. When we are speaking about the Brexit, nothing works anymore. <laughs> well, it seems that uh, the British government has been able to find uh, an agreement on the Brexit, so I think that's good news, but now that agreement needs to be uh, adopted by uh, the House of Commons, and I think it will be uh, far more difficult to make it adopted at that level than uh, within uh, the cabinet. And then the key point for us is the single market, because the single market is a key advantage for uh, the French and the European companies. And we will be very careful looking at what is really within that agreement to make sure that there is nothing within that agreement that might weaken or jeopardize the single markets. So once again, that's good news for us, but we need to be careful and we will really give a great attention to what is really within that agreement to avoid any weakening of the single market. You've said in the past that uh, any decision that gives European citizens the impression that you can leave the European Union and keep all of the advantages would be suicidal. But from the UK point of view at this point, if you look at the instant reaction, there are fears that this deal might be suicidal for the UK, given the response from Brexiteers. Did you serve up a suicidal plan to the UK? You, you know, I'm in charge of the French interest, not in charge of the British interest. And isn't that self-interest? No, my, my role is really to make sure that we do not take any kind of decision that might weaken the European construction. The British people have decided to go out of the EU. I, I really think that it was a historical mistake. But that's the sovereign choice of the British people. So now they, we have to take into account the consequences of that choice, but you cannot be without the uh, European states, out of the European Union, and keeping all the benefits of being within the European Union. Either you are out or you are in. But you can't be in, you can't be out, with all the advantages of those who have decided to be in. Do you really see a situation where the UK will be happy to take all of the European rules, because one of the issues around the referendum was that many of the, the people in the UK were not happy with being served up rigid rules from Europe. That remains the case if you want alignment on customers, customs, that you have to take the European rules. Do you think the UK is going to really proceed with that type of scenario? I know, I know that it will be difficult for the British people and for many politicians to uh, accept to keep the rules of the European Union, but I think that many British politicians have been liars and lied to the British people by explaining that it was so simple to go out of the European Union, that you could go out of the European Union without having strong negative consequences on the current daily life of the British people, on the current daily interests of the British companies. And now you are before the truth. And the truth is that going out of the European Union going out of the single market, going out of one of the most important economic markets of the world is a mistake with very strong negative consequences. When you are lying to the people, there always comes a moment where you have to pay and to explain to the people that maybe it was not the right choice. I hope that in the future, maybe in uh, 10 years or in 15 years, the British people will realize that this is in their interest to go back to the EU and to go back 
to the European family. Can we just canvas the idea of a hard Brexit still? Because on the back of this draft text and Cabinet throwing its support behind Theresa May, it was not unanimous, that support. That's been pretty clear. It was a majority support in the Cabinet. And already there is talk of a vote of no confidence, whether there could still be a second referendum. How destabilizing would it be if this current plan does not progress and we were back to the scenario of a hard Brexit or indeed a second referendum? It's up to the British uh, politicians and to the British government and to the British majority to decide whether they want to go to a second referendum. Frankly speaking, from a personal point of view, I do not believe in any possibility of going back to a new referendum in the coming weeks or in the coming month. But my deep conviction is that in maybe 10 or 15 years, there might be a new referendum when the British people will realize that this is in their interest to face the competition of the United States and to face the competition of China to be together with Germany, with France, with Italy, with Spain, with Belgium, with all the European countries to face the challenges of the new world. But for the time being, we have to be successful in that Brexit and I really hope that on the basis of that agreements that have been built by both Michel Barnier and Theresa May, there will be a way out that will be in the interests of both the UK and the European states. You too may have noticed the amount of denials from the Italian government about pursuing an exit from the Eurozone. Almost daily there has been a denial coming. Do you think the agreement we've seen in this draft text does enough to prevent countries like Italy wanting pursue, to pursue their own exit from Europe? That's also a key point, and you're right in uh, underlining that point. If we give the impression to all the European states and to all the European people that you can go out of the EU while keeping all the advantages of all the other member states, then why should we stay? Why should we abide by the European rules if you can go out of the single market and keeping the advantages of the single market. And that's also what is at stake in the Brexit. We have to be very clear. You want to go out, you go out. That's your sovereign decision, even if we regret it. But you can't keep all the advantages and all the forces of the other member states. Otherwise, you run the risk of having other member states, maybe uh, Italy, maybe other nations, explaining to the people, well, look at the British example. You can have, as we say in French, le beurre et l'argent du beurre. And in English? In English? <laughs> butter and the price of the butter. So I, I really think that we have to be clear on those, uh, on that very specific point, behind all the technical issues, because there are some very complex technical issues and uh, technical challenges behind the agreement on the Brexit, there is one single political point. If you are within the EU, you have more advantages than the ones who have decided to go out of the EU. Help me up with something. The French government has tried to show leadership domestically and in Europe, but some of those plans have seemed to fray thanks to the populist government in Italy. You tried to stick to budget rules in France, which has not always been the case under previous governments, to provide credibility in Europe so you can reform Europe. And that credibility really demanded from German partners in particular. Yet the Italians want to spend up and breach budget rules, which means your progress in Europe, trying to reform the system and have a banking union, a European monetary union, has really been stymied by that big spending Italian government. So aren't all of your plans in disarray thanks to the Italians? You know, sometimes uh, things succeed, sometimes things fail. Uh, I think that the critical point is uh, to stick to our commitments and to stick to our willingness to reinforce uh, the Eurozone. We have that uh, difficulty with the Italian government. They have decided not to seize the hand given and offered by the European Commission. I regret the decision of the Italian government because I really think that it is in the interest of the Italian government to seize the hand offered by the Commission 
and to try to improve that budget. But it should not weaken our willingness to reinforce the Eurozone. Because on that very specific question, what is at stake, is our ability to face a new financial crisis or a new economic crisis. And I will be very frank with you. Are we in a situation within the Eurozone to face a new important financial crisis or a new important economic crisis? My answer is clearly no. We have taken some decisions in the past. We have been able to put on the table new instruments like the uh, mechanism of uh, stability, like uh, some other tools that might be efficient. But those tools are not enough. And we need now to take decisions on very critical issues like the backstop for the ESM, the Eurozone budget to face a new economic crisis and to be able to put more convergence among the uh, economies of uh, the Eurozone. And either we are able to decide by the end of this year or we run the risk of not being able to face any new crisis within the Eurozone. Minister, we are out of time, but I cannot not ask you the question around digital taxes because I know it's dominating your agenda. It's a very I was waiting one. for your question about that. <laughs> It's quite um, an interesting conundrum where you have so many industries being disrupted by technology, yet the technology companies are paying effectively half the tax rate of traditional industries, something that you've tried to correct here in Europe. Yet there is no support because so many different parts of Europe are concerned about their own interests, namely the Germans, that there could be retaliatory tariffs coming from US President Donald Trump if they lob a digital tax. Now, all the measures you're discussing, even an interim digital tax, is not finding support. The, the time frame you're looking at any implementation is really after the first term of the US president, and you're almost hoping the OECD will come up with a measure. Is Europe dropping the ball on digital taxes because it's too scared of Donald Trump? That's exactly what is at stake. Are we able to face Donald Trump or not? I hope that we will be able to face Donald Trump and I hope I hope that we will remain strong and united to face the American administration because I will be very simple and very clear I cannot accept to have Google Amazon or Facebook paying less taxes, 40 points, less taxes than my butcher or my bookshop. I cannot accept that. And if there are some nations among the European nations, if there are some European governments that want to explain to the people that they accept to have Google, Facebook, or Apple paying less taxes than the small companies, than the SMEs in their countries. Good luck for the next European elections. Thank you very much for your time here at Women's Forum. The French Finance Minister, Bruno Le Maire. Thank you. It was a terrific start to Women's Forum, and I want to just widen out the conversation because we have the scene set to talk about global instability and bridging humanity. So let me welcome our next panelist to the stage, Karine Van Hennep, who is the CEO of ING France. <laughs> Sophie Bellin, Chairwoman of Sodexo, the global leader in quality of life services, present in 80 countries. Stefan Richard, the chairman and CEO of Orange. And Dr. Ilham Kadri, incoming CEO of Solvay starting on the 1st of January, the current president and CEO of Diversity. Thank you very much for joining us here at Women's Forum. Well, we've just started the conversation talking about a couple of different elements that have caused global instability, but it's much wider than that. We talk about divisions in communities, in countries, religion, on trade issues, Brexit. There are so many different factors right now that seem to be causing a state of flux globally. 
Karen, I might kick it off with you. Can you pinpoint, in your view, what you think is causing some of the global instability right now in 2018? Well, I think um, we see a lot of sources for instability. Of course, it's technological change, digitalization, automation. It's people on the move. It's globalization, uh, immigration. But mostly, um, we're living a crisis of trust. And we've been living that crisis of trust for many years now. And we cannot lo no longer say, oh, it's just populism, or it's just the man in the street, because it's too broad for that. And to be honest, it's the people we know that don't trust the institutions anymore, that don't trust the governments, that don't trust the businesses. It might be your neighbor, it might be your sister, but it's really a middle class at drift. A middle class that has lost the trust in us, the leaders, in the institutions, to really lead the world through all those challenges. And at this time, with so many challenges at the same time, with a geopolitical instability, we need that leadership, that trust, even more so than before. But at the rate we're going today, we will lose the next election, the next referendum, if we are not able to include those concerns of the middle class in our thinking and to really address them. I might just get you to pick up the, the microphone, Doctor. Ilan, let me ask you, you're a great advocate for women and the power of diverse voices. You've lived between Arab and African cultures. As a CEO, you've witnessed firsthand the impact of destabilizing factors. Weigh in on what you think is rocking the boat in 2018 and whether calmer waters are on the horizon. Yeah, definitely. Well, instabilities have been part of humanity all along the way, right? I mean, uh, we just commemorated the 100-year anniversary of the First World War. Today we talk about, obviously, trade wars, cybersecurity issues, challenges. So I think I'm a businesswoman, so uh, business is about mitigating the risk, is about being adaptable and agile. Uh, throughout, you know, the turbulences and what I tell to my team is that they need to focus on things that they control and they, they can control. So um, the name of the game is diversification. Uh, we like stability, we like globalization, uh, we like, you know, um, having a bit of perspective in our strategic planning. Uh, innovation and differentiation is very important and obviously diversity and inclusion is a big uh, uh, you know, differentiator in this world. Sophie, Stefan, there are microphones for you there as well. Sophie, if I can just uh, pick up with you first up, I want to get another corporate voice in because Sodexo, you've got 460,000 employees worldwide. And what jumps out is that you operate in cities, urban areas, but also in rural, remote areas. And when we talk about global instability, there seems to be a real divide, even in this country, in France, between city areas and non-city areas. Why do you think that we might be seeing that divide? Is it technology? Is it leadership? What are the factors you think are in play? So, um, as you said, you know, Sodexo is a, is, is a big organization. You know, we are 460,000 people in uh, 72 countries. So it's uh, like, uh, you know, size of the country or big, a big city. And, uh, and we touch every day uh, more than 100 million uh, people. Uh, and at all stage of their life, you know, we touch uh, uh, kids in school and uh, young adults uh, in, in, uh, in the office. We touch uh, patients in hospitals. So I think we have a big uh, footprint uh, uh, on, on people, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and but, but for us, uh, I think from the beginning, when the company was created uh, 50 years ago, um, one of our mission was to improve the social economic and environmental uh, uh, progress and, and, and improve the, uh, have an impact on, on the communities and, uh, and the region where we operate and the countries where we operate. So, so today in a world of, uh, of instability, I think uh, we absolutely, of course we are affected by this instability and, and uh, and uh, you know you were talking about Brexit and the rise of nationalism in in a, in a lot of, of countries, and and with uh, with so many people, and at the same time uh, we touch so many people, and at the same time there is a so shortage of uh, of uh, labor in, in some countries, and especially in our business. So it raises the questions, and also. Uh, uh, we are more and more, you know, because we employ so many people, we are more and more questions on, uh, on the question of, uh, of, uh, of migrants 
and, uh, and, and refugees. So, uh, so I definitely am convinced that uh, companies like ours have a role to play. Uh, they absolutely have a role to play uh, in this uh, world of instability. And the other, uh, and that may be more specific, uh, you know, um, to our organization, uh, we are a, a private uh, company and uh, my family still owns 42% of the business and 58% uh, of the shares. So we are an independent company. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and in addition to that, you know, we are committed to stay like that for another right. 50 years. So why am I saying that? You know, I'm not just here talking about the financial independence, but what does that allows us to do? It allows us to keep our mission, and we have a double mission, you know, improve the quality of life of our people and the people we serve, and also, you know, the mission I told you on the social and, and yes. economic and, and, uh, and enver environmental uh, aspect that we want to improve in the region where we operate. So we want to, it helps us to keep our mission, okay. to keep our values, uh, service spirit, team spirit, and spirit of progress. It helps us also to have a long-term strategy, you know, and keep our long-term strategy, not change, you know, every other year. And also, it helps us to keep, to, uh, to keep, ha to have a uh, um, long-term and, and, uh, and uh, continuous uh, managers. And, uh, and for example, we just uh, yes. appointed a new uh, CEO uh, in January, and Denis Machuel, our new CEO, is the, is only the third CEO in, in, in 50 years. Mm. So it's like, I, I don't see many companies where <laughs> you, know, you yes. only had three CEOs in 50 years. But, and, and that's, you know, that long-term vision, I think is really an asset in a world of instability. We'll pick up on some of those points in a minute. I want to get another voice in, and Stefan, typically you and I catch up at technology events. Uh, your company, very interesting, operating between developing countries, right here in, um, in, in Africa, for instance, and developed countries. So two worlds you cross as well. We've been so focused in recent years about access to capital with cheap credit globally. How do we bring some developing nations with developed markets? But you think there's another issue at stake here, a digital divide, how technology is now dividing up nations? Yes, definitely. Uh, I see this as a, as a major uh, challenge for the world. Uh, if you uh, accept the idea that uh, the internet and connectivity worldwide can be uh, a decisive uh, lever to uh, uh, accelerate the development um, of especially less developed uh, parts of the world and, and especially the African uh, country. Uh, we, we need to, uh, uh, to change clearly the, the speed uh, of uh, our common uh, work in order to connect uh, better the world. Today you have uh, one human being out of two who has no access to internet. And in Africa, it's uh, only 22% of the population with, who has an access to internet, 22%. So it shows you how deep is this digital divide. Um, connectivity and, and, and the digital age, let's say, can bring, in my view, um, uh, major contribution to solve the problems of human, humanity uh, it can be really um, an historical step forward for the progress and the development of mankind. But of course, uh, it it's supposes that, that we can fix this problem of, of uh, worldwide connectivity. And uh, uh, the telecom companies like Orange uh, cannot do this uh, alone because we are, of course, uh, ourselves, we are investing massively in Africa. You mentioned Africa. Uh, we are investing over 1.5 uh, billion euros every year in Africa. We have more than 100 million customers in Africa. Um, but we cannot cover and connect the whole African continent uh, on ourselves. Of course, Orange, but also the, the other uh, operators. We need to have a more collective uh, movement uh, to be created in order to find uh, other ways, alternative ways also, 
uh, to accelerate in this connectivity. This is the reason why uh, I uh, have decided to launch a, a call, a call for uh, accelerating the connectivity of Africa. Uh, I have published a small book, the name is Human Web, uh, to, to try to explain this. And uh, as I have been uh, elected as, as, as chairman of GSMA, which is the uh, uh, world, world um, organization uh, gathering the, the telecom companies, I will clearly uh, take this uh, action as a, as a priority within GSMA because I think we can today uh, have with us a number of uh, uh, players, of course in the industry, but also uh, the big tech uh, giants, um, uh, countries, uh, these policy makers of, uh, in Europe, in the States and in, uh, in other parts of the world in order to, uh, to really uh, accelerate uh, and, and fight against the, this digital divide. Indeed, you are the new face of Mobile World Congress come next year. I want to ask you then about digital taxes because you and I have been dancing around the issue of who pays for connectivity, who pays for networks for, for a number of years. And as developed worlds move towards 5G, other markets are still working on other connectivity. Are digital taxes the solution? When you say digital taxes, you are uh, thinking of this project of uh, tax regarding the GAFAM or, or the tax that, that we are paying. Because just to mention this figure, in France, if you uh, look at the, the whole amount of taxes that are paid by let's say, digital uh, companies, uh, the GAFAM is paid today 3% of those taxes, 3%, and we, the telcos, are paying 80%. So there is a kind of unbalance, I would say, to say the least. Uh, if you look at then the economic positions uh, and the market positions of, uh, of each of those companies. So yes, we, today we have a totally unbalanced uh, situation, an unfair uh, situation, at least in Europe, uh, where in fact the only uh, ones that are paying taxes are uh, uh, ourselves, ourselves and of course the, the rest of the economy, but if I am just talking about digital economy, uh, uh, telecom companies are taxpayers, uh, yes, it is a problem. Yes, it is a problem because we, we are asking the same time to invest more and more in the networks, but also in innovation. We are asked also to be competitors to some extent to uh, the big tech giants of the US uh, partners and competitors at the same time. So yes, we, we claim uh, what we call the level playing field, meaning a, a fair and, and uh, uh, competition and tax conditions for everyone. And we want clearly uh, to stop those uh, differences that are still made between people, people of the digital ecosystem. Uh, there is no more reason to make a difference from a tax point of view between a telecom company and a software or a communication company, let's say, uh, belonging to the, to the digital ecosystem, like the GAFAM. Uh, and, and this is for us a very important uh, uh, priority in, uh, in, in what we are asking to, uh, to European institutions. I drew some links earlier with uh, the finance minister about digital taxes and whether that could trigger a new wave of tariffs at a time when global coordination seems to be breaking down on many issues. It's another point of conflict. Karen, I want to come back to you on this sort of big issue around security, immigration, trade, the environment. Has that replaced some of the conflicts on those areas? Has that placed global coordination on major issues? Um, well, what we see is that global coordination today seems to be more difficult than it was 10 years ago. And maybe we've taken all those institutions and a well-functioning trade system for granted. Like we've taken peace for granted for so many years. Um, and at the same time, as I said, that middle class uh, is not trusting our leadership anymore. While we need it even more, those institutions to function, if we want to address a trade war, if we want to address geopolitical tensions, if we want to address sustainability, or technology. Technology is a source for the good, but we need to use it wisely. So the question is, how can we actually gain back that trust of the middle class? Because if we don't gain it back, we will not be able to use our multilateral organizations. We need to reform them. We need to reform the European Union. We need to reform the WTO. 
But if you look at that middle class that has a fear for the future, that's facing true technology, many good things, but also job light growth, different jobs, different skills needed. So they think their children might have a bleaker future than they themselves. And if we're really honest, if we look ourselves at ourselves here, then we are alike. We are internationally oriented. We embrace change. We are cosmopolitan. But why does your sister, your neighbor fear that future? Because maybe we're not listening to their concerns. So yes, we need gender diversity. Yes, we need culture diversity, and that will help. But if we don't acknowledge there's a diversity of opinion, that there's really a middle class who has a fear for the future, we will lose those elections. And I think it's up to us as leaders, as maybe the elite even, to include, to understand that difference of opinion and to really acknowledge diversity of opinion. Even if we don't like it, even if we call it populist, even if we think it's political incorrect, it's by now the majority of the people around us, so we better understand them and we better include them. Ellen, do you want to pick up on some of those points? Because as we talk about global coordination, at a different level, we still have to tackle the issues on a grassroots level to make change and to heal some of the divisions. Yeah, definitely. And Karen said it very well. Um, it's about diversity and inclusion. And diversity is not only the gender, it's uh, religion, races, ethnic, color, um, and obviously the diversity of thoughts. Um, and when you have diversity in the room, uh, you need inclusion. You need to listen to it. If not, why having it at all? So that's, that's key, and that's key for our businesses. Um, I have the honor to lead diversity today. We belong to the same value chain as Sophie Belong. So we are in hygiene and cleaning in more than 84 countries around the world. And it's important for us to be diverse. Uh, it's not for charity. We do it because it impacts the pocket. So it's very important. Our customers are global. Even if we are global, we are local in the way we execute our business, in the way we go and, uh, and fish for new businesses, new customers, etc. So it's extremely essential. It's actually a competitive advantage today to be more diverse than your competitor and when you have it in the room to again be inclusive so I'm a believer obviously I'm pure, pure products of diversity and inclusion that's why I'm here um, and we need a, a pipeline we talk a lot about women at the top but how you get more women at the top is through having a pipeline of youth um, and having the right training giving them the right perspective around the globe and, and giving them the chance and then grasp it and do better things out of it. Sophie, this is a slightly tough one to you. There's a big protest coming on the weekend and maybe the biggest protest that Emmanuel Macron faces as president at this point. And it's quite unusual, this high-vis protest that's coming. It's about an increase in the fuel tax on diesel, also slower speeds, all designed to save lives on the roads. Yet, it's everything but that now. It's pitted about the cities versus the country or rural areas, a divide that exists where the government isn't really able to tackle the issue of pollution and saving lives. It's come back to divisions in society. So is there a role of business? Because it seems like all the onus is on government to solve some of these problems. What is the role of business in this context? Well, I said, you know, uh, earlier, I think uh, businesses have a very big role to play. You know, government, first, uh, you know, you said it, you know, people don't trust uh, the government uh, anymore or not enough. You know, some people don't trust them uh, not enough. So uh, I think we have to work uh, end to hand, you know, with government, with ONG, uh, with uh, different businesses, uh, even, you know, with other companies or competitors or clients or providers. Uh, we have to work hand in hand uh, uh, to build that trust, that trust again, and especially in the in this uh, world where everything is changing so fast. And uh, and uh, and as I said, you know, I think that at Sodexo our governance is 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 a strength, is an asset. But I think also the fact, the way we operate, um, is is also a strength because. We are a company with uh, 34,000 sites in 72 countries. And in France, for, in France, for example, we have 4,000 sites in, um, in, um, uh, with 32,000 uh, people working for us. So in fact, we are seen as a big international uh, global company. But in France, we have 40,000 SMEs 
with less than 10 people. And they are, yes, in Paris, but they're also, you know, in all the region. And in, in the city in France, okay, we, we feel the children, but also we give an, uh, a job to some of the parents. Uh, uh, we manage the hospitals. And, and I think that, you know, uh, or in Paris, you know, we, we have like uh, two thirds of our, uh, our sites are in a uh, quartier prioritaire and, you know, all the, the, the places where the government wants to, uh, to decrease the, the unemployment. So that's why I really think that uh, companies uh, have, have a big role to play uh, in, in, in that area and, uh, and that we have to uh, work, to get, work together uh, because I'm describing what's happening at Sodexo, but I'm sure, you know, uh, at Orange, uh, you have some same issues, you know, uh, some people have to change jobs and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and you have a big impact of, uh, of what, what's happening in France and I'm sure in other countries and in, in the region in France. So, so uh, I definitely, uh, and, and I'm definitely think that uh, we have a big role to play. Um, and to build on that, um, in my industry, the hygiene and cleaning industry, there is a triple 70 number, magical number. 70% of the workers at the low level, so housekeepers, cleaners, are women. 70% are illiterate or they don't speak the native language of the country they, they work in. And 70% turn around because very few have dreamed of becoming a cleaner. So t every year you change 70%, up to 70% of your workforce. So our industry and we as the leaders, we have the duty to build the pride in this industry. And how you do that? You do that through technology. You do that through sustainable solutions. You do that through uh, retention packages. You do that through bringing more millennials who are you know, excited about your company. So I think branding you know, the company around strong values, uh, diversity is one, innovation is another one, differentiation, globalization and allowing people to travel between continents and industries is extremely key today to be the, the best and the most formidable competitor out there. I think we all sort of see the urgency and the need for change, but there are so many obstacles standing in the way. And Karen, perhaps you want to touch on that. I mean, we, we spoke about it a little bit with the, the finance minister, about the urge for the French government to change Europe before it's broken, before the next crisis, uh, on the back of Brexit, there's clearly an imperative to fix Europe, but all that seems to have fallen by the wayside because of populist governments. So nothing's changing when we're talking about new governance solutions here in Europe, right? Um, yes, that's true. Huh? Um, at, the other, at the other hand, what we also see is that, and it's almost a blessing in disguise what's happening, um, because of the Brexit, because of the election of Trump, because of what Putin is doing, you see more and more people saying, but we need more unity in Europe. We need more European leadership. Whether it's to stand up in trade disputes, whether it's to address security and immigration, or sustainability. And I think sustainability is a great example where businesses take their responsibilities, but also where individual cities and US American states take uh, their responsibility. Trump might have said, I want out of the Paris Agreement. New York City, the state of California have said, we are in, we're still doing this. The European Union is driving sustainability on a grand scale, but so are the businesses. And three years ago on COP21, that was here in Paris, it was the businesses who took the lead in sustainability. And for us as a bank, uh, we do green bonds, we do green financing, we really try to use our balance sheet to make our own clients more sustainable and more aware of climate change. And we now even write loans where people get a discount if they're more sustainable. So you see a movement of people, of businesses, trying to drive sustainability, but also starting to understand that we can't do it alone. We need that European Union to be more integrated. And you see people movements coming there and getting there. But we are not there yet. We're still far from further integration. And I hope we don't need the next crisis to get that blessing in disguise even further and convince people even further. But that's also up to us all to make sure that every time that we talk about Europe, we also talk about the positive things that Europe brings. We talk about what Europe can do for us. As citizens, we talk about how we need Europe to do it together and not stand alone country by country. 
Let's just come back to the conversation through your lens at Orange because you've spoken about all the massive investment required in networks and clearly the onus has been on companies like yours to spend the money. But we've spoken in the past too about consolidation in French telecoms and that seems to be very key to the mix that you have profitable, strong companies in the sector who can drive change and we think about what's coming, 5G. Well, 5G is going to be very integral to automation. Automation, very key to manufacturing. Who has the profits in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Do you think now, as we have a push this week to consolidate perhaps Telecom Italia's network with open fibre, the Italians are going after consolidation, does that put some fire back in the belly to bring back consolidation talks in France around the telecom sector? Well, uh, let's say that the market situation in France with very low prices, price war, uh, puts uh, all the players under pressure. And when you are under pressure, you are probably more open-minded to look for solutions. Now, this being said, my view is that in Europe, uh, the way this industry is considered by the uh, uh, authorities uh, has not really changed. Uh, let's take a spectacular example of this. Uh, you have a, a European country, Belgium, that has recently decided to create a fourth license to have a fourth mobile operator. It's an 11 million uh, great country, of course, Belgium. Uh, in the same time, in the United States of America, uh, this industry has decided to switch from four to three players. And in China, there are ongoing discussions uh, to switch from three to two players, two players for 1.3 billion people. Uh, so, when, when you consider this, of course, you are still uh, skeptical about the real capacity of Europe to change uh, the s software, if I may say so, uh, that is applied to this, uh, to this industry, which is mainly viewed as a consumer-driven uh, industry, uh, where the, the, the number one uh, target of any uh, public policy is to ensure that the lowest possible price is rich for the consumers uh, without taking into account any uh, other consequence of this. So we have been uh, uh, claiming for the rights of consolidating this industry in Europe where there are over a hundred, 100 uh, players in the telecom industry. Once again to be con compared to four, soon three in the US or three in China or three in Japan. Um, but I have to say that so far we have uh, uh, met a very limited success, I would say, in, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in, in this speech. Now, my view is that uh, we should uh, try again. We should try again. Domestically and or cross-border? Here in France. Cross-border is, uh, is, is a different issue. The issue of cross-border consolidation is not an antitrust issue. It's an equity story issue, if I may say so, because we are in, in, an, in the mainly local industry and no one has never been able to really prove that there are some value uh, to be created out of cross-border consolidation. But it doesn't mean that we will not see this uh, one day, but it's, uh, it's basically a strategic financial economic issue, not an antitrust issue. But in France, once again, because your question was about France, my view is that if we want to ensure the um, progresses in connectivity, and by the way, it's a very important answer to the uh, territories issues that you mentioned with, uh, with the strike uh, on Saturday and so on, to be able to bring fiber to the home, to the last village in France, to be able to fix the uh, problems of uh, quality of coverage, of mobile coverage in the country, which are very uh, different from what you can see everywhere else in Europe. Because France is a relatively large country, uh, is a, a country with mountains, with uh, very remote and rural areas, and so it's much more difficult to uh, cover properly the country than Belgium, the Netherlands, or even Germany. So if we are able to, to, uh, uh, to, to, if we want to be sure 
that we will be able to, to bring fiber to the home and a good coverage, uh, uh, mobile coverage, uh, we have to work again on, uh, on uh, domestic consolidation. Um, and, and my feeling, my, uh, well, uh, my wish also is that we, we will meet again around the table between us to try to see if we, if we can uh, revive uh, a solution. You will talk to the other key players here in France yes. soon? Yes, soon. Okay, <laughs> you heard it here first at Women's Forum. We are out of time, but I want to just get a quick takeaway message, something tweetable, and this is on the key topic here, bridging humanity. So, Karen, how will you take action to bridge humanity? Um, I personally, um, I pledge to include diversity of opinion, and I will continue to fight for Europe. Sophie, well, two or three words. I think, you know, we, we talked about a lot about digital because it's, it's, uh, it, it's uh, changing uh, everybody's life. And, uh, and, uh, but I think it's, all, it's also creating uh, anxiety um, around jobs and around... Uh, me, I want, I want to stay very positive and I, I think that uh, it, it can, you know, uh, uh, vi vi virtual world digitalization can also create loneliness, you know, and, and not being part of a, or being part of a group, but uh, but virtually. And I strongly believe that uh, uh, people, you know, a smiley will never replace a real smile, right. and that uh, that jobs in in uh, with human touch and, and uh, are important. So I'm I'm very uh, positive with that and, and, and for the future. Stefan, how will you take action to bridge humanity? You know, we, we at Orange uh, uh, um, want to contribute to building a world which is uh, more digital and more connected because we think that it can bring once again uh, uh, a real progress to to humanity, but human human centric. And we will do nothing in terms of technology, in terms of innovation, in terms of partnering with uh, the rest of the e ecosystem without uh, uh, taking uh, human interest first. Ellen, the final word. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, listen, um, the theme is uh, bridging humanity. So I'm going to take the bridge as a metaphor. What does a bridge do it, it takes you from A to Z, it takes you to a new place, right? And also, it helps you to go through rough waters, right? Or walk over rough, rough waters, instabilities. My bridge, my personal one, has been education. So I pledge that education is extremely important to prepare the youth um, to, to, to help us to go towards more prosperity. Uh, and probably the second tweet is, we need more in the digital world to learn and learn and relearn. Elam, Stefan, Sophie, Karin, thank you very much for joining us at the opening plenary. Thank you very much. You can do it this way.